Before we talk about the specifics of cryptography, let's go over some situations which gave birth to the field of cryptography. A famous example you might be familiar with is the Caesar cipher. Julius Caesar, a famous leader and general of the Roman Empire, would often send messages with sensitive information to his fellow generals, such as information about an impending attack from an enemy. Of course, this information could be misused if it got into the wrong hands. What would be the ideal scenario then? It's one in which Caesar sends a message to his recipient, but only he and the recipient can read it. Anyone else trying to understand the information would fail. Is there any way to achieve this? Well, there was a term developed in the last half a millennium to mean precisely this, known as encryption, the process of transforming information into an unintelligible intermediary piece of information which can be transformed back into its original state with decryption. This is different from cryptographic hash functions, as the input is not meant to be inverted by anyone after the function is applied. Encryption schemes have two functions in use, the encryption function and the decryption function. The encryption function will take some meaningful data and turn it into something illegible. The decryption function, on the other hand, will take the illegible information and make it meaningful. How can we use this? Let's say we have a piece of information known as X, which we want to keep secret. If we encrypt X, it becomes E of X. Anyone who reads E of X should not be able to figure out what the value of X is. In other words, they do not know the decryption function. Let's say Alice sends E of X to Bob, and Bob has the decryption function. This means that he can run the decryption function on E of X to get the original input X. In other words, D of E of X should always equal X. As long as only trusted third parties have access to the decryption function, only they can read the encrypted information. So how does this relate to Caesar's ciphers? Caesar designed a scheme to perform exactly this. A Caesar cipher is meant to be used on text. As you can see on the image on the right, each input corresponds to some output letter. Caesar ciphers rely on what's known as substitution, meaning that every letter is replaced with a different one. Let's go through the process of how a Caesar cipher works. First, a random number is chosen. This random number represents the amount of spaces the letter will be shifted. It's called a key because it unlocks the secret message, making it the secret which allows someone to figure out the decryption scheme. If the key were publicly known, then the Caesar cipher could be easily broken. It's said that Caesar used the key 3 for all of his ciphers, as demonstrated in the diagram. In this section, however, we'll consider that any key between 1 and 25 can be chosen. Since there are only 26 letters, there's no point in choosing anything higher, since we just end up looping around to where we started. This encrypted message can be sent out to others safely now, assuming no one else but the recipient knows how to decrypt the message. When the recipient receives the message, they will use the key to recover the meaning of the previously illegible information. In this case, decrypting the message requires shifting every letter in the opposite direction as the encryption function by the same amount, the value of the key. Now, the recipient has the information, but no one else does. When the recipient receives the message, they'll use the key to recover the meaning from the previously illegible information. In this case, decrypting the message requires shifting every letter in the opposite direction as the encryption function by the same amount, the value of the key. Now, the recipient has the information, but no one else does. Voila. Keep in mind that this scheme does not imply anything about the integrity of the message or guarantee its delivery. If this message were a note carried by a bird, there's nothing to stop someone from shooting the bird down and tearing up the note or even changing a few letters during transit. This means that all we have is the guarantee that the information will not be read by an attacker, but they may be able to mutate or even destroy the message entirely. Those other guarantees might be secured by other cryptographic or computer science measures, but those are out of scope for this lecture. Let's consider a scenario in which we might actually use a Caesar cipher. Let's say that in the year 69 BCE, 
Nadir and I are generals in the Roman army. He wants to send me a message. Nadir and I are both good friends with Caesar, so we're familiar with his famous encryption scheme. As everyone knows, aliens played a big part in the building of the cities of Rome. During their trip, they gave Nadir and myself a great deal of knowledge about blockchain. We decided to leverage that during this process. For whatever reason, he wants to send me the word blockchain. But how can we use the Caesar cipher to protect his message from foreign eyes? Sometime when Nadir and I met in person, we decided to use the number 21 as our key, since Bitcoin has a cap of 21 million Bitcoins. This means that our table would look something like the image below. As you see, there are two rows of 26 letters. In the top row are the letters A through Z as normal. In the bottom row, every letter has been shifted to the right 21 times. Instead of starting with A, this row instead starts with F and ends with E. Essentially, the first letter now corresponds to the sixth letter in the alphabet, the second letter to the seventh, and so on. So now that we've generated our table, how can we use it? Let's try plugging the word blockchain into the table and see what happens. The first step is to locate the letter B in the top row of letters. Once we've done that, we can then use the table to figure out which letter it should correspond to. As you can see, it happens to be G. We go ahead and append that letter to our new encrypted message. With the second letter, L, we can go ahead and do the same thing. We locate the letter L, locate the corresponding letter Q, and add that to our list. If we skip ahead to the end, this is what our final result looks like. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that because it makes absolutely no sense. But that's exactly what we're trying to do. We want it to make no sense. Nadir can now send this message to me without fear of anyone else reading it. Let's say Gloria, a traitor general giving secrets to the enemy, happens to intercept this message. What can she do with this message? She can burn it or corrupt it, but she can't read it. Perhaps she doesn't want to mess with the message, since that could inform Nadir or myself of the traitor. So she decides not to do anything. By using the Caesar cipher, we foiled her attempts at betraying the Roman Empire. So I've now received the encrypted message. How can I turn it back into the original message? As mentioned before, I need to decrypt it with the decryption function. In the case of the Caesar cipher, I'd be using the key to make the function. Only this time, instead of shifting letters to the right, I'd shift them to the left. In other words, I'm undoing the shift that Nadir did on the original message. Again, I plug the message into the table, and I get the original word, blockchain. Success. Nadir and I, as an added layer of obfuscation outside of the Caesar cipher, happened to use the word blockchain as a keyword to mean prepare your defenses, meaning that he knows of an impending attack on my fortress, possibly due to aliens. I set up my defense and am safe from an enemy attack, all thanks to encryption. The Caesar cipher wasn't the oldest kind of cryptography, nor was it the last. There are several other examples from ancient Egypt to modern life. The Enigma machine, cracked by English hero and computer scientist Alan Turing, was developed by the German army during World War II to make messages indecipherable during transmission. The machine was possibly the most complex encryption scheme on the planet at the time. During World War I and World War II, America also devised a way to keep messages private. However, instead of coming up with a code, they chose to seek help from bilingual Native Americans from various tribes, known during the wars as code talkers. Because of the complexity of Native American languages and scarcity of speakers, they were asked to serve as communication intermediaries. A general would safely give a message to a code talker, and the code talker would then translate, then relay that message over a long distance to another one. Notice that the translation from English to the Kotaker's language, such as Navajo or Cherokee, represents the encryption step. The second Kotaker would receive the encrypted message and translate it back to English for a second general to hear. To tie this back to cryptography and cryptoeconomics, you can tell that each of these devices are used after a decision is made, 
such as crafting a message or file for delivery. Cryptography in all these examples focuses on securing the decision decided upon by some entity. We'll now go over some of the primitives in cryptography, which serve as building blocks for larger devices to accomplish this decision securing. 